are listening to Out of the Box with Rosie Tran. Out of the Box is sponsored by HugMeTees.com. Spread love, give a hug, HugMeTees.com. We are now on SoundCloud, guys. Click on the SoundCloud follow button. We need new followers, and we love new followers. And as always, we're on Stitcher and iTunes downloadable. I am here today with speaker and... Um, I don't know, positive transformational person. What would what would you say, Lee? <laughs> sure, yeah, that works. <laughs> Lee Choladenko. Um, Lee, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. How are you? Good. I'm really excited to have you here because you are just um, taking what we learned. We so Lee and I did a personal development workshop together, mm-hmm. and you are just running with it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was. It's funny. It, fit. it came at a really amazing time in my life. I've been doing this type of work for a long time, and MITC brought a really interesting um, uh, aspect that I hadn't really looked at in my own practice. So um, when I met you, you said that you were doing a, you know, a small business, mm-hmm. and then the class. So, so for those of you who don't know, these are the types of workshops that I've talked about on past episodes. They're personal development workshops, and... Um, I want to talk about the value that it brought to your life because, you know, I just did an episode um, talking about the power of these, of working on yourself, Mm -hmm. personal development, taking some of these seminars, and I got a lot of amazing feedback, but I also got some negative feedback. You know, Mm -hmm. I got, I had someone send me a scathing email that said, well, you know, people are just born with being grounded or these skills and you can't learn it. It can't be taught. You're teaching unconditional love. You're teaching transformation can it be taught? Yeah, that's an interesting question because, you know, on some level, what we're learning is something that we all already know. And that's part of what I practice. And that's part of what I believe. It's that unconditional love isn't something that we get or that we attain. It's just something that we are. It's, it's who we are. But we can learn to become aware of it. And because we can I think a lot of people it. have forgotten who they are in mm-hmm. a way. And I know that sounds mm-hmm. kind of, you know... Um, metaphysical and very out of the realm for people Mm -hmm. and so i like to explain these things on a very scientific level but you know children have the capacity to love unconditionally and then Mm -hmm. i would say we're socially conditioned to forget about that aspect of ourselves yeah well we're also conditioned to show up for other people and to just totally abandon ourselves and we're conditioned to kind of not really look within but to please others to show up to to please them to get acceptance from the outside when, um, and that's part of conditional love. And that's conditional love, exactly, is, is showing up in a way that we get love from the outside. But, you know, like, you know, pra- the practice that I do and the practice that I've been drawn to and very much what MITT is, it's inside out. It's work going from the inside out. So it's learning to love ourselves first um, before we can give love to other people. And it's not about approval. It's about acceptance. So I want to explain a little bit um, about conditional love yeah. um, because – you know, my podcast is about all sorts of things. I have people from finance, religion, mm-hmm. personal development, all fields. So it's not just about personal development. So some of you listeners might be like, huh, what, what are they talking about? Mm, yeah. <laughs> so conditional mm-hmm. love is what I would say the majority of people are taught. And that's basically, like you said, getting love from the outside. So mm-hmm. if you're good, I you deserve love. And mm-hmm. if you're bad, you deserve punishment or lack of love or whatever. Yeah. Right. That's how mm-hmm. the conventional quote unquote way mm-hmm. we're taught. So what how would you describe um, unconditional love and and what the meaning of it for people who are maybe not aware of some of the stuff we're talking about and are just sitting here like with a question mark over their head? Yeah, like what is unconditional love? Yeah, like what are you guys talking about? What does that mean? Mm-hmm. Does that mean romantic love? Does that you know right. some people might be clueless to what we're saying? Right, right. Well, that's a great question. So, I mean, unconditional love is what I would say, and I think a lot of others kind of like spiritual teachers or people who are um, interested in investigating themselves on the inner, in the inner space is that unconditional love is essentially who we are. Um, it's kind of the, it's it also could be called God. It could be called divine energy. It's, it's whatever it is. It's the kind of love, Nate love force of the, of the universe. Um, unconditional love um, is actually quite simple. It's actually just loving ourselves no matter what. And loving other people no matter what. And it's not conditional on what we do. It's not even conditional on how we're even acting. It's just the, it's, it's kind of like the divine mother that says, I will love you no matter what. And a lot of people think that they need to get love through a relationship or they need to get love through other people. Um, But unconditional love is available to us in every moment. I mean, we can be loving with ourselves. And I think part of the drama of the world is that we think that to fill the voids inside of us that we need to go to other people and go to other places to get that love 
um, when really spiritual teaching says we can bring that to ourselves so that we don't need to look outside. Let's talk about what you're saying because it's very profound and and a lot of people don't understand this. Mm -hmm. So say I'm going to explain this in very layman's terms for those Mm -hmm. of you who, like I said, may not be familiar with the concepts we're talking about. So say um, I... Uh, I'm in love with you, Lee. <laughs> <laughs> I'm flattered. <laughs> um, and so we have this whirlwind romance. Mm-hmm. So a lot of people feel that the love that I have for you is because you are here. Mm-hmm. But what's really going on is I'm creating that love in myself because you're triggering it. Mm-hmm. And, but actually, that love is coming from inside of me. Mm-hmm. And that uh, that is a way to explain n- that what you're saying, which is that we can tap into it at any time. Mm-hmm. You're just the trigger. You're the projection that I'm projecting the love onto. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of times when you go away, Lee, you're like, I'm leaving you. I'm breaking up with you, Rosie. I feel a sense of loss. Mm-hmm. But that love didn't come from you. It came from inside of me. Mm-hmm. And that's, I think, a way to kind of visually illustrate to you listeners what he's talking about when he says it comes from inside out, not outside in. The way a lot of people think is, Lee, you're the one bringing me the love and that I have romantic love. Just uh, in this example, I'm using romantic love. I have this love and I have this self-value and self-worth because you're validating me and you're giving me, loose quotations, that love. But that love isn't coming from you. It's coming from inside of me and it's generated because you're tri- you're triggering it by through romantic love or whatever. But we all have the capacity to to tap into this love, not necessarily from, like you said, an external thing, a romantic partner, a pet, a daughter or a son, whatever. A lot of people, it's just a projection of, of the love that's inside of you. Does that make sense? Am I explaining this in a clear way? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Oftentimes when we're in relationships, we tap into the love space in our heart. That's already there. That's already there. And we think that the person outside of us is giving us that love, but it's not. It's already inside of us and it's being activated. Now, we also can learn from each other how to love ourselves. So sometimes someone can be loving and forgive us. You know, if someone forgives us, like if we're in love and you make a mistake and I forgive you, you can actually receive that as, okay, this is what it's like to be loved. And you can take that as a practice to love yourself. But on the essential level, on the energetic level, yeah, the love already existed in your It's heart. already inside of you. And, Absolutely. And you wouldn't be able to experience it or feel it mm-hmm. if you didn't have it inside you. Right. So regardless of what, whatever person, so a lot of times, you know, people are in a marriage or a relationship and they're not getting what they want from the other person mm-hmm. and they're saying, well, I just need to get rid of this person and get a new person. But that's mm-hmm. not the solution to the problem. Absolutely. And we can jump from relationship to relationship looking for what, we're never going to find outside But we can't of find ours. it inside of us. Exactly. <laughs> we can't find it outside of us, but it's always within us. That's why sometimes what happens is that the universe is very interesting. I mean, the way that I see this is that, you know, we can go from relationship to relationship and it can feel sometimes like it's destructive. Like one relationship doesn't end, the next relationship we begin and that breaks up too, but and that it can feel destructive. But that's the, <laughs> we're getting the message there that it's like, okay, it's time for us to look inside and stop to look, stop looking outside of ourselves to fill that void. And so eventually you know, if we're really um, aware and we listen, we get, you know what, it's inside of me. And this is, stuff is not esoteric. It sounds esoteric and it sounds metaphysical, but it's very grounded. It's very real. I mean, it loving is. ourselves is it a is. very it's grounded, tangible. Rooted, it's a tangible very tangible practice. thing that you can see. But I guess, you know, a lot of times I hear a lot of people, you know, I talk about this stuff all the time. And of course, I get tons of mail, sometimes praise and sometimes mm-hmm. hate mail and other negative things. And I want to address... You know, of course, I love my fans and I love you guys who are listening and, and, and supportive and understand it. But I want to reach people who maybe don't understand it mm-hmm. and make and because I've had many people who are have been skeptical or cynical. And I think that they're they're thinking of it as a very kind of I, I use the word a lot on the podcast, hippy dippy thing. Mm-hmm. And they're not understanding that not only is it real, a lot of this is scientifically measured. You mm-hmm. know, they've measured, for example, um, monks in meditation uh, raising their vibrational levels and their their temperature raises and mm. they feel more relaxed and and these things and when it comes to love certain practices for example you know i do a meditation where i close my eyes and take deep breaths and i tell myself i am love i am love i am love mm. and the there's been so many studies done that if you do that on a daily basis that you're more relaxed more happy more grounded like you said and so these are very tangible results that you can feel in your life. And also your belief systems, of course, you know, control what you think and feel and how you see the world. Absolutely. And not only that, but also like, you know, bringing love to ourselves is also very, a very tangible practice in the sense that 
you know, for those people who maybe think it's kind of an esoteric or out there thing, it's really, I mean, if in, if in any moment I decide to stop beating up on myself, that's self-love. That's perfect. That's perfect. If I decide, you know what, I'm good enough the way I am, I'm going to get off my own back, that's self-love. So what about judgment? Because mm-hmm. a lot of people, and I, mm-hmm. I also want you guys to understand if you're listening to the podcast and you're agnostic or atheist, you know, I know Lee mentioned spirituality and and you know, you can call unconditional love God or whatever. You don't, it doesn't necessarily have to be rooted in a religious, Mm -hmm. you know, um, belief. Not at all. In fact, I'm my very much not, not religious, (laughs) you know, I I mean, I really am not religious at all. And it's interesting because what I'm talking about is really just, I mean, if there is a religion, it's the religion of the human being, you know, so your humanism, that's, that's great. I'm so glad you said that because sometimes people hear certain religious words or spirituality or God, and they immediately shut down and they think, well, this is not for me. They're talking about something with religion. I mean, it's all semantics, you know, at the end of the day, you know, it's, it's all just, it's all words, but it's interesting that, you know, sometimes the, the, what the words we use, it's what's available to us are just words that linked with religion. But, you know, really what we're talking about here is really just coming into our heart as human being and accepting ourselves where we are. And it's funny that you mentioned, mentioned judgment because, you know, we all judge, you know, it's like we all judge all the time and there's nothing wrong with that. But I think, but letting go of the practicing to let go of the judgments. Well, actually it's funny. I think letting go of the judgments, I don't know if, if you've tried that, but I cannot actually physically let go of my judgments. <laughs> You know, it's like, it's like the most challenging thing, right? But what we can do is we can actually bring in our judgments and love them and accept them as just part of the human experience. And then we realize that underneath the judgment, there's something for us to learn about the way that we see ourselves. That if I am judging you for something, what I realize is that really underneath that is I have an insecurity about myself that yes. I'm projecting as yes. a judgment onto you. Yes. So judgments actually are one of the most beautiful practices, one of the beautiful um, tools that we have to learn about ourselves. Because if we can become aware when we're judging that my judgment of you is really a reflection of myself, then that's that's juice. That's, well, let's, let's explain that. Let's yeah. explain that for people who who don't understand projection. So, yes. pro- so guys, projection is a psychological... Um, uh, I don't know what you would call it. Um, it's a psychological trait that human beings do mm-hmm. where we put our beliefs on others, right? Is mm-hmm. that a fair sure. way to say that? Sure. So okay. for an example is, um, let's say when I was growing up, I had uh, issues with feeling small and shrimpy because I was really, really skinny and I was really, really <laughs> small. And I, for some reason, my parents decided to have me long hair, you know, so I looked like a girl, right? So, so, <laughs> so <laughs> like, you know, a, a while ago, you know, when I was in my, you know, 15, 16 years old, if I look at someone and go, God, what a shrimp, you know, look at that kid. He's such a shrimp or he's girly or something like that. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's your own it, insecurity. It's my own insecurity exactly. being projected on that child and everything is projection and it's not necessarily a bad or good thing it just right. is what it is you know you can project good and bad onto people oh, absolutely yeah not just it's not just bad stuff and right. and that becomes um judgment so that's really important what you're talking about and that's beautiful you mentioned that too because with judgment if i'm projecting i mean if i'm saying to you wow rosie such an amazing person oh, that's thank actually you. <laughs> thank you <Lee. laughs> which is true but it's also it's also on some level a judgment right it's a, it's a judgment of you not yes. that it's a negative but it's a judgment so that's also me projecting a judgment on you so if we if we look at judgments as looking at that we project the shadow parts of ourselves and the light then we actually learn about our shadow but then also our gifts so if we look at somebody if we look at even um like bill gates or if we look at you know anyone else who's um, really successful in life or someone who just someone that we meet in the supermarket that has that energy that we really are drawn to and we admire and we say wow look at that person that's really us that's which is, that's which very is, interesting. Which is really cool. So it works both ways. It is really cool. And I, you know, for those of you who are listening who might be like, well, you know, what about this one person? They're so annoying or blah, 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 blah at work. You know, am I projecting that? On? I'm not annoying like that. You don't recognize traits about people unless it's something inside of yourself. You know, mm-hmm. I, as an example, I have mm-hmm. um, a friend who is is very irritated with something that their mother does all the time. I, f- I can't even remember what it was. And she's like, can't you see how annoying that is? It's so annoying that she does that. And because it wasn't an issue that I had, it totally didn't bother me. Mm. Does that make sense? Right, absolutely. Yeah. So her mom would do, I, I can't even remember. I think her mom would like stomp around the house or something, but it was something that it didn't bug me because it wasn't my projection. Mm. It wasn't my issue. So I never even noticed it, right. but it was in her consciousness because it was a button for her. Absolutely. So if it's not something within your, 
inside of yourself or a projection of your darker light, like Lee said, it, it won't bug you. Like you won't notice it right. in others. Right. Yeah. Right. Totally. And that's also proof that judgments are parts of ourselves because if we don't notice it, it's not a trigger. It's not a trigger. And then it's exactly <laughs> right. It's not a trigger. <laughs> um, yeah. So you were doing a small business and now you're um, going towards are you becoming a public speaker or personal development teacher or what? what um, yeah, is I'm your working path? towards uh, being a public speaker okay. and getting more engagements. Um, I, I have spoken at a meditation center before and I've done um, some other kind of smaller things. So what is the message that you really want to, I, I know that you said mm-hmm. unconditional love is so important for you. What is the message that you really want people to understand that, that, that you're going out to speak about that's so yeah. passionate and imp- important to you that you, you know, left your small business and decided that you wanted to do this. Yeah. Well, what's so important to me, and I think the reason why I'm really even beginning this venture into sharing um, and into public speaking is that I want to share that we are all completely lovable just the way we are right now, without needing to be fixed, without needing to be changed, that there's nothing inherently wrong with us, even when we have our beliefs that we're lacking or ugly or um, unworthy, that that's all a farce. It's all not true. Um, and that really who we are on the essential level is unconditional love and that, um, it's available to us in every moment. Um, and it's so important for me to, um, share this because that realization has been a very transformative one in my life. Um, taking me from a place of being in pretty severe emotional pain to being in a place of feeling much more empowered. So what type of emotional pain, what, what were you going through that was so traumatic that, that you needed an, a spiritual awakening in a sense. So when I was in college, um, I was, yeah, I was about 17 years old and I was experiencing just so much emotional pain, the kind of like crippling pain where I would just get into pajamas and get in bed and go to class. Like a depression or some type of, yeah, it was just a severe depression of just the world is over. I suck. I'm totally screwed and I'm never going to get better. And I really didn't know why I just felt this really deep sense of doom um, and I felt it physically and I felt it emotionally and I just was, and you weren't able mess. to get out of bed, was not able to get out of bed. And, um, actually my, I reached out to my aunt, my mom, my mom's sister, um, who's been like an angel in my life. She's absolutely amazing. She sent me a book by Paul Farini called love without conditions. And that is one of your teachers. Now. And this is currently one of my teachers. Your now. Mentors. Yes. <laughs> yes, one of my mentors. That's right. That's right. And it started with this moment. It's like, I read the, I opened the book. What was the, the book again? For the, the book called love without conditions okay. by Paul Farini. Yeah. And I read the first page and I just burst into tears. I just lost it. It was the first time that I had re- really received the message that I'm okay the way I am. And it's the message of unconditional love, acceptance, compassion. And I, I resonated with me on such a deep level and that I knew in that moment that I was tired of running away. Now, did you grow up in a very emotionally abusive household or were you putting this self-abuse on yourself? That's a great question. So through my exploration of my childhood, I actually grew up in an extremely loving household. And that's what was so interesting about my past that people would look at my life and they would look at my childhood and my parents and go, why is this kid in so much pain? But what I realized is it really had nothing to do with my parents and it had nothing to do with my upbringing. It's just that um, I think I was born with a sensitivity to things around me and the things that I experienced in life. I mean, obviously I did go through some hardships as does everybody else. And some of them were much more severe than others, but you know, it still was, it still was um, it still was about my sensitivity and who I was as a person. And also, I think maybe what I was kind of meant to learn. You know what? I think what you're saying is very, very profound because mm. um, there is a lot of I don't know if you have heard of this term, but suburban white angst. Mm. Uh, and it's it's been showing up a lot on you know the Internet as a lot of young men trolling Mm. And and I don't know if you're familiar with Mm. trolling. I'm not familiar with trolling, no. Uh, Trolling is when um, kids are suffering from a lot of pain, kind of Mm. like you talk about. Mm -hmm. And they go on the internet and they just leave vile comments and do Mm. cyberbullying towards others. Oh, okay. Yeah, and it's a projection of their deep unhappiness. And Mm. it tends to be, you know kids from good families you know they really don't have this severe hardship and so i think it's very important that you are talking about this Mm. because it's kind of an epidemic and a lot of you know people dismiss it as a well these kids are just spoiled brats and they have nothing to complain about or nothing to whine about what they're just these rich suburban kids Mm. and but i think that it's important 
what you're saying because you don't have to be you know raped or molested or have some crazy third world existence to feel emotional pain i mean that's just silly right but and you don't also have to go through this insane amount of um suffering to have a spiritual awakening i mean you did suffer Mm -hmm. but as far as you know some people think you have to have your leg cut off in the vietnam war to have some type of spiritual awakening right you know what i mean right well absolutely and i think one of the worst things that we can do for people um, like that and like myself is discount the emotional experience no matter what it is. I totally agree. Because, yeah. you know, obviously that's there's a truth to it in the sense that they're experiencing it, right? So part of my thing was to learn to accept that that's just how I was feeling, not beat myself up, not say that I'm wrong or not start beating up on myself that I'm sensitive and, you know, whatever but, uh, the stories are. It's very important because, you know, regardless of what, you know, the person is suffering – I, I had I was dealing with a lot of emotional pain at one point in my life mm-hmm. and I would reach out to people and a lot of people would say, oh, you'll get over it. Or they would mm-hmm. be very um, dismissive of it. They'd mm-hmm. say, oh, you're young. You'll just get over it. And that's not the way you want to address it. You know, luckily, I you know, did a lot of work on myself to get healthy. But some kids, it leads to suicide. It leads to, you know, as we have seen in the news in the past five years, mass killings or other things mm-hmm. because they can't handle the pain. It's so intense. Yeah. So the last thing you want to do is dismiss someone's pain, even if, even if it's something that you wouldn't find painful. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think this is really we're getting to like some meaty stuff here because I think this it's really about how we hold all of this and how we see it. And I think in this way, compassion is one of the most important tools in the self love process and in the process of loving ourselves and others because as we begin to feel compassion for ourselves no matter what the experience is as we feel compassion for other people who are in pain then we begin to see that really it's just you know pain is part of the human experience there's nothing wrong with it and it's, but a temporary it's not who we thing. are it, and it's, it's that, temporary it is very temporary that's what you know if you're in pain if you're suicidal if you're depressed this too will pass. I know that's, you know, a cliched quote, but it's true. It, it's nothing is permanent. Even being happy. You can't yeah. be happy 24-7, seven, seven days a week. Right. You would be mentally insane. Right. So happiness, just like depression, sadness, extreme pain, are all, te- all temporary and they, and they move and flow throughout the physical Absolutely. body. Absolutely. And how about this? It's not even, it's not even ultimately real. It's not. The pain. <laughs> the pain. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, the pain is an illusion of what we think is going on or what we think is true. But, you know. Part of the work is to say that it's not true. It's who we really are is unconditional love. So I want to address two things that you said that are yeah. very, very important. So first of all, what about the skeptics that say, Lee, this person is a serial killer. They've killed mm-hmm. 10 people. Are they unconditional love? And mm-hmm. how would you explain that to someone who might bring up an argument like that? Um, every single person on this earth is unconditional love. Um, we, as the human beings, seem to put value on um certain things and 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 uh create um meaning in certain ways not to say that what people do isn't atrocious and horrible and sad and destructive and i mean people do that human beings do that but those um, are people who are not in touch with their unconditional love is that what you're saying yeah it's just simply people who forgot and these people have had things happen to them and they think that there's no way out and they think that they're not going to be loved and that they're totally screwed But um, what is our job um, as meaning my job and your job and every individual person in the collective of the world is to just understand that our essence is love no matter what. And I'm glad you brought this up because, you know, there's so much going on in our world right now with people hurting each other and people hurting themselves. And obviously there's a lot of violence and a lot of collective fear is rising. Um, And I think this is a really perfect time to just say to just acknowledge that okay we're all scared <laughs> you know we have that's some okay. issues yeah we have, we have some issues yeah. <laughs> and that and that you know these people that are doing these things are simply people who forgot who they are and you know they deserve love and compassion as much as anybody else because they're most people who are doing destructive things are in severe pain themselves and they're yeah, projecting that that's, that's all it is i mean i just can't understand i just can't get behind that there's somebody who's who's essentially bad like that and who would just do that it's people who are um in severe pain or in severe pain who are so disconnected from who they are and they're you know doing all these things because they don't know what else to do but i think it's important to remember that uh to kind of stay out of that drama to stay out of the drama of all that forgetting and to just stay and root and ground in the remembrance of okay i am love you are love 
<laughs> this guy over here with who's doing these horrible things to other people. He is love. That's good. Um, mm. I also wanted to address, you talked about the work. Now, yeah. obviously, I know what the work is because you and I are very good friends. Uh, but uh, for, for those of who are listening and saying, well, how can you work on yourself? What does that mean, the work? Mm. Because you've mentioned it several times in our conversation already. You said, when I'm doing this work, when I'm doing, what does that mean, the work? To yeah. someone who, who maybe, you know, they forget a lot that they're unconditional love. How can they do the work to remember? That's a great question. So when I mean the work, I really am talking about spiritual practice. Um, spiritual practice also looks simply like loving ourselves um when i'm talking about the work i'm also specifically i mean that's essentially in my eyes the work of the human experience is learning to love ourselves that's the work and loving ourselves and others unconditionally stepping into our power and serving other people to step into their power and learning their value and their worth and expressing their gifts right um but there's a lot of different people and a lot of different things that have a lot of tools that we have to be able to practice this work. So, so what are some of the tools? Yeah, Tell us. Okay. We want to know. We want to <laughs> so, know. <laughs> so I've been, I've worked, I've been working with Paul Farini for about the last four and a half years. So um, for those of you who don't know, Paul Farini yes. is an author and spiritual teacher. Yes. yes. He's an author and spiritual teacher. He's written over 40 books on unconditional love and spirituality. Um, many of them have been worldwide bestsellers. Um, and uh, he's on Facebook and Twitter. And um, actually I, with him created some videos of him speaking that are on YouTube. Yay! And yeah, and he holds retreats on Palm Island, Florida. And they're we will absolutely put some of amazing. The, we will put some clips of Lee or some clips of Paul on the website with this episode. Guys, yeah, so great. don't forget to visit outoftheboxpodcast.com. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. And so, um, yeah, so there's, you know, he has brought in this amazing work and it's actually a roadmap and it's divided into three phases and it's the awakening, the healing and the empowering and the empowerment phase. Um, this is the work that I was so drawn to when I was in college and I was all this pain. It was actually this roadmap that I found. Um, and after that I you went, started reading his first After book. I started reading his books and I, and I started going to his workshops and then I just, I just, I just, um, experienced, um, profound healing and profound, um, yeah, deep, deep emotional healing, spiritual healing. And, um, you know, four years later, I, I'm feeling compelled to, to share it with other people. Um, I think it's one of the most profound and amazing works there is. Now, there's tons of works, and it's not the only one. It's not the best one. It's, you know, for me, it's what I was drawn to. But there's so many, um, so much work available. Uh, Byron Katie also has something called The Work. <laughs> Uh, so what is this work? Um, there's this thing called the work, right? right. <laughs> <laughs> a work called the work, and um, yeah, and, and she put, it has in a beautiful uh, thing as well. And, um, yeah, and so these a- are the physical tools that people can use mm-hmm. and practice with their mental and emotional well-being to improve their their health and their and their mental and emotional happiness. Absolutely, yeah. and I mean, there's meditation. Uh, there's meditation, there's yoga. Um, I've taken meditation with one of the most phenomenal meditation teachers. I can imagine Matthew Spangler. Um, who is an amazing teacher. He has the meditation effect. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's an incredible. Maybe we'll put the, the link to that too. It's just, it, there's amazing tools available to us. And what I think is so beautiful is that when, as we cultivate them, it's just more on the tool belt. Um, and that's what I think is so important too. It's just simply just a practice. There's, no, you know, there's really not that much magic in this. I mean, there's a, kind of a mysterious process in this because obviously we don't really know what we're talking about. I don't really know <laughs> what I'm talking about, you know, but it's just, it's just from my experience and it's from the gut and from the intuition, but I don't really know what I'm talking about. But that's what's so amazing is it's totally being in that unknown space and, you know, just kind of going with the practice and knowing that, um, that there's really not a lot of magic. It's simply just doing the practice. So I want to make a distinction between what you're talking about in false love. Because there's a lot of false love that that people use to make themselves feel better. When we talk about unconditional love, we're talking about feeling whole and healed, whole and healed and happy. If you're doing things like drinking, taking drugs, or you know doing things that are used to fill the void in an artificial way, mm-hmm. that's a false love. Mm-hmm. And I want to explain that because some people, I think, still don't really understand the. I, I know, you know, I do life coaching, and I've met so many people who have a difficult understanding of the distinction between selfishness and self-love. Hmm. And I, I, I just want you guys to understand that selfishness is anything that is destructive. It's not, um, I don't know, you know how to describe in your own life what you would consider destructive or not, but it, you're feeling good, but it's like you said, from the outside in. Mm-hmm. It's not the inside out. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know, in a nutshell, self-love is not selfish. And selfishness is not being loving. So if I'm being selfish, I'm taking, I'm not being loving. Um, but if I'm taking the time and the space that I need to cultivate a loving relationship with myself, that's self-love. Maybe you can give some, um, 
kind of s- tangible examples for people who 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 get confused because I, I know I've met a lot of people who I try to explain self-love to them and they're like, well, that's being selfish and they don't really get the distinction. So, yeah. And I think that a lot of times people actually don't practice self-love because they think it's being selfish. So they yes. think they're taking from their partner or that their kids are going to be lonely without them or exactly. whatever it is. I mean, sometimes in the process of self-love, we do need to take time for ourselves, but you know, it's, it's really like not even, it's just a, um, selfishness is kind of a, a story. I think that we create to, to kind of, keep ourselves from really giving ourselves the space and time that we that we need um to be loving with ourselves but i think there's a difference like for you know so if if people if someone's like has a cocaine addiction yeah that is maybe they're saying well i want cocaine i need cocaine it makes me feel good but that's not being self-loving no no yeah. not at all and i mean that's um i would say that's being destructive yeah you know self-destructive i would say that's just you know separating from self so how but so how can someone know if what they're doing is being selfish or self-loving that's a great question so i'm actually going to um do something that paul taught me okay <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so um one of paul's questions that's at the root of his real happiness work is the question am i loving myself right now um am i loving myself right now and that is such a profound question because if we in any moment stop and go okay am i loving myself right now We'll either get a yes or no, you know, or we'll get a maybe or an I don't know or whatever it is. But it's like, you know, if I'm, you know, doing lines and avoiding my life and I ask the question, am I loving myself right the now? The answer is no. That's going to be a no. <laughs> you know, if, you're going, if you're going to get a massage, <laughs> but you feel guilty, quote unquote, because you might be leaving your spouse or your kids with a babysitter, that is self-love because one, you're loving yourself. Right. And two, you're going to be more rejuvenated for your kids and your husband or whoever. Right, right. And I don't think there's really any right or wrong answer about what is loving and what is not. But I think that that's question is great. That's a compass. For, it's, yeah. That's a, exactly. That's a great compass because when we can ask that, we can stop, we can evaluate. And then if the answer is no, then we have the choice of saying, okay, we accept that compassionately. Okay, I'm not loving myself. That's okay. And then I, from that moment, can choose, okay, so how can I love myself in this moment right now? And then we take that step. So what I hear is that when we're making missteps or flaws or sins or whatever you want to call them, Mm -hmm. one of the keys to being self-loving is to not go into beat up mode. Yes. Because I know, I know a lot of us are our own worst enemy. Yep. Absolutely. And part of it is recognizing what we're doing, you know, quote unquote wrong. I use that loosely because the wrongness comes in our judgment, Mm -hmm. but and also to forgive ourselves for making that mistake because, yes. you know, we're, we're human. Absolutely. And forgiveness is a practice that we have to do at all the time as human beings. Yes. It can be very, very difficult at times because mm-hmm. we are our own worst enemy. Yes. And that beat up is really, um, is really conditioning, too, is the way that I see it. Is that, you know, when we beat up on ourselves, that's definitely not a loving act. Um, it's really about remembering to be forgiving and loving in every moment. So forgiveness is a practice that needs to be done over and over again because we make mistakes all the time as human beings. You know, we make all the mistakes. The, the problem is that we start beating ourselves up for making those mistakes. But, you know, like I was saying earlier about judgments, it's like if we accept our mistakes and we bring them in and we love them, then we realize there's always something to learn. So if we can just accept it, we'll look at it, say, okay, I know that there's something here to learn. If we take that in then you know, we forgive ourselves for making that mistake and then we move forward with new information, with new knowledge, with, with deeper knowledge. And then we're learning from our mistakes and then mistakes don't become bad anymore and then we stop beating ourselves up. So it's like, you know, some, some of this is a, really a cycle, but it starts with getting off our own back and just saying, okay, I'm acceptable even if I'm making mistakes, learning and then moving forward. Why do you think that there's such a um, resistance to mistakes in our society. I mean, Mm -hmm. I I feel that, especially the way I was brought up, not just my parents, but in in school, there was an emphasis on not making mistakes instead Mm -hmm. of, like you said, making mistakes and learning from them. Mm -hmm. I mean, is this just part of our current consciousness or? You know, I I think it's just human conditioning that mistakes suck. (laughs) 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 You know, and that we're bad for making them and, you know, all that. So, um, yeah, I would say that it's it's really... um, it's really probably just conditioning, you know, I don't know, but, um, but just from my experience and my observation that it's, it's just that most people really are, are horrified of being crucified and they're being hor- you know, horrified of being crucified for mistakes and for being felt wrong. Now we're kind of touching on another sensitive nerve, which is being wrong versus being right. 
and mistakes. Let's talk about that because yeah. this is a really important topic. Yes, that we know a lot about from yes, our <laughs> <laughs> experiences together. But yeah, so you know, being being right is one of the biggest obstacles to so many things that we want to success, to successful relationships. Um, I once heard somebody say that being right is the biggest obstacle to having a loving, equal relationship or partnership. Oh, that's because, really profound. Yeah, because if I have to be right all the time, I mean, forget about it. You so, know. so what, what, what do we get from being right? I mean, are we validating our ego? Is it? I mean, what? Mm-hmm. Why are people so obsessed with being right? Because that is one of the psychological precepts that people, you know, that causes war, that causes, mm-hmm. saying my belief system's better than your belief system, my religion's right. better than your religion. You know, I'm right, you're wrong. Right. Right. I think being right is validating the ego. And it's saying that, so if we're wrong, then we're crucified. Then we're going to get blamed. Then we're going to get shamed. And now we're left with a feeling of unworthiness. And the reason why I brought it there is because unworthiness is one of the fundamental human um, shadow experiences, meaning that it's, it's the two biggest components of our dark sides of our shadow of as human beings, it's fear and shame. And this is what Paul says. And there's been a lot of spiritual teachers that have said the same thing. Um, but fear and shame are the fundamental components of our dark of our shadow. So being right keeps us from feeling less than other people, because if we're right, we're better somehow, we're, better. we're smarter, we're, we're smarter, yeah. we're superior. The problem with being right is that there's no equality in being right. You're better than everyone else. You're better than everyone else. So you're, you're by a, yourself at the top of the mountain. Right, right. And so is that, is that right, right. But here's the thing. Is all by yourself. <laughs> right, right. All by yourself. And that's the thing, too, is that it's an illusion. Because if I'm wrong, then I'm in the valley, you know, with everybody else. And who wants to do that? So it's kind of like if, you know, it's, it's a little bit of a catch-22, you see. <laughs> so it's really like we can't be right, we can't be wrong. But here's the thing is that being – it's just a but rabbit hole going it down is. that. And it's just a so hole. you people know, you know – uh, some of you who may know people who are self-righteous or may be self-righteous yourself, there's no one in heaven with a big chalkboard saying, oh, he was right mm-hmm. this time. She was right this time. She was wrong this time. He was wrong this right. time. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody is keeping a tab. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Except for us, right? Except for Except us. Except for us. Our own tally. Our That's own right. tally of how That's many right. times we're right. And I have heard people say that. I think, thankfully, I'm not friends with any of these people anymore. But I, you know, I had some friends in my past uh, life that um, would say phrases like, well, I'm always right, or yeah. I, I'm never wrong about things. Well, yeah. maybe that's true. But when you have that narrow perspective of you're always right, you definitely are always right, but you're, but you're right in your very narrow perspective. Mm. Because right and wrong is very subjective. Mm. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. So what are some of the other, you, you talked about shame and fear, right? Let's yes. talk about the shadow, the shadow experiences yeah. and the light. Sure. So um, the shadow really just represents um, the parts of ourselves that we shove away because we don't want other people to see it. Um, it's the part of ourselves that we feel ashamed of, that we don't think we get it, that we don't, that we feel we don't get approval and love from the outside. So we stuff it because if it doesn't give us love and approval and people don't like it, then we want to shove it away. We don't want to let it go. But so each of us essentially, um, a lot of what Paul's work says and a lot of the work that I'm familiar with is that um, we all have a shadow component. But there's nothing it's wrong our dark with that. It's side. Just, it's, it's our, our yeah. yeah. It's just it's just who we are. It's just we have a shadow component. It's our fear and our shame and all that too. But what's interesting is that when we're kids, we push away all the things that we think don't get us love and approval, including some of our gifts. So the shadow is a really fundamental part of the spiritual healing process because we cannot get to our light unless we go through the darkness. So, for example, if you're a little girl and you're really, really good at singing, you mm-hmm. love singing, but maybe you get teased for your voice or something, uh-huh, something like that. That's a great example. Yep. Or the, the parents say you're never going to make it. Uh, being a singer, you're not going to make money. How is I going to put bread on the table? So you or push it aside. You push it aside and go, screw that. Okay. So what does dad want me to do? Oh, he wants me to be a lawyer. Great. So now I'm in law school when this, there's still a little girl inside who wants to sing. And and so then you have this love, unconditional love inside of you and you're repressing part of yourself and that, yes. that adds more darkness. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. And then we don't trust ourselves and then we get upset with ourselves and we have resentment because we know it's a part of ourselves that we're shoving and that's our joy. So what's beautiful about this too is that if we follow our joy – then we really start to get a sense for what it is that is our life's purpose. You know? So what about if you have a joy that people around you are heavily persecuting? How, how, what, how do we deal with that? Well, it's, that's, it's, a t- it's tough. I mean, it's not tough to do. It's not easy to do something where everybody else around you is saying that they don't want you to do it or they have judgments about it or they're trying to make you stop. Um, but um, I think what's really important is just to simply be aware of what's happening. And 
you know, just in every moment, just commit to your, to your heart, commit to the heart, commit to the heart, just saying, you know, this is what I'm here to do. And, you know, sometimes it might take separating yourself a little bit from that community, from that space, from those people. It might take um, having an honest sit down saying, I'm going to do this anyway, and I'd really love your support. Um, sometimes it means saying, you know what, I need to take my my space and, you know, what, whatever it really takes. But, you know, essentially the point is just that we that we learn to honor ourselves and we learn to um, and that honoring ourselves is, is loving ourselves. Um, and, it is, you know, and I, I think that's why a lot of times children are more free and open and loving and emotionally free. And that's that's hmm. why many people see children and they see innocence and love and all these hmm. other things. Yet, you know, because it's it's a time sometimes before you get shut down mm-hmm. into your darkness right. because a lot of children haven't had that experience yet. And, and I think as adults, part of our job is learning to be childlike again. Mm-hmm. That doesn't mean being childish or immature, but right. it means having that spirit, that energy because children, you know, they, they tend to l- do what makes them happy naturally yeah. until they're conditioned not to. Yeah, absolutely. And I think what we're actually touching upon here too is um, the, the kind of notion of having like an inner child. Yes. Um, of having an inner child. And, and I think when we're talking about the shadow especially, that we can also look at the shadow as an inner child, is looking at the fear and the shame and um, these parts of ourselves that are we're scared, we're, we're worried of feeling less than other people, of being blamed, of being crucified, um, or of being you know scared to be the singer or whatever it is, as being a small child who feels lost and unloved so loving but, the inner little little rosie or the little lee yes and saying yes and being maybe a parent to yourself if you didn't have the best parents yes yes absolutely and even if you had great parents you know even the best parents in the world can't bring us the love that we need but it's just part of the human setup that's why we learn to bring love to ourselves and other people because we're that's what we're learning you know so for me it's like i bring love to little lee and be sensitive to Little Lee's needs and listen to him. And, you know, Little Lee wants to be an artist. Great. So, you know, where do we go from there? And I think that, you know, in the beginning, we talked about tangible results. And you mm-hmm. said, you know, this may sound very esoteric, but it's not. It's very tangible. And, you know, we see this, actually, if, you, if you're if you thinking still that you don't agree with what we're saying or you don't really understand it. On a daily basis, we see celebrities, multimillionaires, people mm-hmm. that have on the outside what appears to be everything yet they're hopelessly depressed they're drug addicts or they commit suicide or other things like that because if all of these external things that you know marketing and and tv and the, the whatever industry tells us that we need to be pretty or happy or whatever they're all external mm-hmm. you know and having and it's it's already been proven you know we don't need to um if you if you're questioning what we're saying how many people that do you know that are rich and successful? Some of them are happy, but some right. of them aren't. And so all of right. these external factors are not a guarantee of happiness. And so Absolutely. then we say, well, where does happiness come from? And where does love come from? Joy, where does all that come from? Right, right. And that's, that's, a, that's a, um, a wild goose chase. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, like running around trying to buy up all these things to make us pretty and attractive, right? It's so funny because at the end of the day, self-love is cheap, you know? <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> You know, we don't need all these products and all these things, you know, it's, it's just, um, it's, it's, it's a much cheaper route. (laughs) You'll save money too. You'll save money too. It's a money saving venture. That's right. (laughs) And, and not to say that these things don't bring happiness, but it's a very, uh, fleeting happiness. Yeah. It's fleeting. Yeah. Yeah. And it's also not on the level that we all need it. It's not, it's not on a very deep level. It's a very shallow level, you know, Yes, I found 10 bucks in my pocket before and jumped for joy. But, you know, how long does that last? Five, right. ten minutes. Right. And, <laughs> yeah, and for me, it's like sometimes I sit down to a meal and it's so good that I think I, I just don't eat anything else in my life besides that meal. It's so good. I feel so much love inside. You know, I mean, I'm just a total foodie. But it's like, but at the end of the day, it's like, you know, the meal ends and, you know, but that's that's like a relationship too. It's like we're in a relationship and, you know, at some point we realize that we don't, you know, it's just everything from the outside. But, you know. The thing is, too, is I think what's important to underscore with all this as well is that it's not about beating ourselves up for being happy for these things or, you know, for the outside or, you know, if we find that $10 or we're at that restaurant. It's or okay we, to it's, have fleeting happiness, but, absolutely. but to of generate and procure and work on the inner happiness as much as we can. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and if, we called, if we're called to do that, then we just, you know, have to realize that it's going to come from the inside and not from the outside. And then, you know, where we start is, is you know, where we start. That's okay. We start at the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. And it's okay to have both. 
And it's, <laughs> absolutely, that's right. And that's a great point. It's totally 100% okay to have both. I, I think it's great to to think about the idea of having it all because, you know, I, I've coached some people with mm. my life coaching that have said, well, you know, I just can't have it all. You can't have it all. And, mm. you know, then I point to certain athletes or celebrities that have a loving family you know they're happy on the inside and the outside Mm -hmm. and they go well that you know that's for them that's not me and that is a form of denial denying yourself Mm. the idea that you can't have it all because i I think that we're here on earth to spread joy and spread love Mm. and also enjoy ourselves oh yeah you know as long as we're not hurting others oh yeah i mean like i was saying earlier like joy is a way shower joy is a way of coming into the heart you know joy fun having a blast with it i mean that's the thing too is like you know there is an aspect of this that is that is quite serious because it's you know whatever but it's really not you know like really none of this is that is is serious it's really you know i once heard actually my my, i think my aunt told me that uh enlightenment is really just about lightening up (laughs) (laughs) you know it's really just about like giving it up having fun and yeah letting it go and yoga they talk about choosing a higher vibration choosing a higher thought so instead of saying my back hurts or my shoulder, my shoulder is tight, saying my shoulder is opening up. Hmm. So it's not that uh, it's so dark and horrible and, and you're in so much pain. And, and you know, I'm not just discounting pain if someone listening is in extreme pain. It's just forcing yourself to kind of choose a higher, a more positive thought. Hmm. A different yeah. vibration, a different, you know, whatever thought, a different level. So so it's it's still the same thing, essentially. But one is, is going to bring you a little bit more peace mentally right. to say you know my shoulder is opening up instead of my shoulder is tight right and it's also a positive affirmation exactly it's, i mean it's affirmative it's agential it's not negative or backward it's not yeah. negative right so um let's talk about the power of words since you brought that up mm-hmm. um how important are the words that we speak to ourselves you know it's interesting i i think there's a lot of people um, who do similar work that would say that words are very important. It's like how we say it and, you know, people seem to like to nitpick a little. Uh, but, no, no, I'm not saying, uh, uh, not, I'm not saying yeah. the minutiae of the words, but I mean, how important are the, the types of things oh, we say oh. to ourselves? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, I think that's that's pretty much everything. It's kind of like that interior, internal monologue. Um, what I think is interesting, though, I don't think that part of the path of happiness is about changing the inner monologue to something else. I think it's about acknowledging what voices we do hear being loving with those and just connecting with the love inside of our heart and knowing that, you know, it's okay to have those beliefs. And so it's really becomes less about talking to our, you know, less about kind of the words and more just about the energy. The feeling. However, the feeling. Yeah. However, um, I do think it is really important that we do cultivate a dialogue and a, um, a, a kind of a relationship with our inner child, with the part of us that feels scared, that feels ashamed, the part of us that's also really excited about something that we're not letting out, you know, the, the light that we've suppressed, you know, that we do have a dialogue that's, you know, I love you, I'm here for you, um, you know, I hear you, you know, you're okay, you know, <laughs> like things like that, because I think that that kind of a dialogue is really um, um, uh, getting at kind of the crux of a healthy relationship with oneself, mm-hmm. um, and one that's healing and transformative as well. And your relationship with yourself is the most important relationship you'll ever, ever have. Even more important than your spouse, boyfriend, or girlfriend. Because, I mean, essentially, not to be, you know, too harsh and, you know, real world, whatever. But we essentially come into this world alone. And we die alone. And and not alone in a negative kind of dark, oh, you're going to die in your grave by yourself. But, Mm. you know, your significant other may pass away. They may leave you or whatever. And so the one person that you're stuck with kind of for the rest of your life is the person in the mirror. (laughs) (laughs) And it's true. I mean, it's all we really got is us. So I would say that the relationship with ourselves is the single most important relationship. And it's Mm. very important uh, for, Mm -hmm. for us to get to know ourselves. And, you know, like you said, not push those feelings down, not push those dark sides Mm -hmm. down and to, to embrace every part of us because, and, And even if it means changing your whole life, you know, if you, the example I used with the girl singing, if you realize at 45, you were never meant to be a lawyer and you were meant to be a singer, you know, maybe your wife is going to be pissed or whatever, but you got to listen to yourself. Yeah. Yeah. We can't, you know, once we, once we hear the voice of truth inside of ourselves, we can't deny it anymore. You can't, otherwise it, it, I mean, so what happens? So what happens when people just keep denying, keep denying, keep denying? What, what is, what are some of the negative effects that could happen to them? You know, I actually haven't even heard of, of somebody who's become really aware of what they want to do and then, and then keep 
shoving it down and and you know whatever but i know that it's that well, probably happens well, let me let me give an example because yeah. i just i just met i just did a podcast i'm not going to say who it is because i don't know if he's out or not but i did a podcast mm-hmm. with a gentleman and um he's he's gay mm-hmm. and his boyfriend they were together and they were going to get married and he, he ended up um going quote unquote back in the closet and saying mm-hmm. you know i choose to be straight and 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 marrying a, a woman because he thought that's what his family wanted mm-hmm. so he basically honored himself and then re unhonored it i guess yeah and you know when that and happens, what are some of the psychological consequences yeah i mean i think for me I, I you know i don't really know but i think what happens is that it just builds a lot of pressure in the psyche and we what happens is that the divide in our psyche starts to grow between the truth of who we are and what we're presenting to other people and you know i mean that's that's also a mask you know that we wear um to hide who we really are but i think the most important really thing is that you know sometimes we can get kind of lost with how it looks and the results that we create but really at the end of the day it's it's whatever um allows us to come become more aware of who we really are um that is the transformation and everyone's like at a different place with it you know and it's like whatever um you know it's like it's like it the mask we wear can be destructive. It can be destructive to other people. Um, and sometimes, you know, in a lifetime, if we just become aware that we're wearing a mask and we don't actually end up ever taking it off, sometimes that's enough of a lesson for a life. That's a big old lesson. You know, <laughs> that's a big thing to learn. Wow, I'm wearing a mask. Cool. You know, I mean, that, that's awesome, you know, and then and then it takes a lot of courage, though, to take that mask off, you know. But, you know, at the end of the day, we all, you know, we all show up and even when we become aware of what of our patterns you know we can make the choice and we can make the decision to just stop doing that and, and sometimes we take the mask and, and another mask shows up <laughs> yeah, absolutely <laughs> absolutely so i mean for me it's like i had the golden boy mask for a long time like a, the golden boy you uh-huh. know and then i also had the good boy meaning like um kind of like the one who all my the friends of my parents loved and you know, I was just a good boy, you yeah. know? And so, but that was a mask. I mean, you know, I got angry and I got upset, but I kind of shoved it because it what didn't seem acceptable because you wanted to be the good boy. And you wanted, wanted to be, be acceptable and you wanted to get love from that. That's right. Yeah. And I still, and I still um, work with not being a people pleaser, you know, quite often and just kind of like honoring my decisions, even if people don't like it and really saying my truth. And that's why all this is just a practice because we're practicing all the time, how to be authentic and how to be real and, I think that's really important what you're saying and I'm I'm really glad you brought that up because mm. I'm kind of a good girl and I mm. you know a lot of people tend to focus on um the dark energy where you know certain masks are the the mask of the bad boy or the mask of but you can wear mm. a mask of being a good person. I mean yeah. that is a mask. Yeah, definitely. That that's why a lot of people, you know, um in the NA or AA world, you know, they have all these issues but people in the Al-Anon world or the codependent world even sometimes even have a more difficult time because if you're an alcoholic for example you have alcoholism you can Mm -hmm. say well i'm an alcoholic i'm this and that sometimes with the codependents or the good girls it's harder to kind of work on the issue because you have this facade of well i'm just trying to help the alcoholic or i'm Mm -hmm. just trying to help or i'm just and you're not realizing that it's like the same side but the diff the coin but the different side of the same coin kind of thing yeah right where it's still a mask but you're absolutely. just getting different different rewards for it i guess conditions right. absolutely right right and you know the mask can look like a like a bunch of different things um you know it's it's really quite diverse and we can also have you know bad boy and good boy masks at the same time i mean you know all kinds of stuff but usually we we, we have kind of like one or two personality traits that we really use but more good, than others i guess what my point is is that the good mask can be as self-destructive oh yeah it's not you know for example you talked about people pleasing mm. you know doing what others want and not listening to our own voice can be very destructive absolutely absolutely i mean the point of the mask is to cover up what's really going on underneath exactly but you can be in the pain with the good girl or good boy mask is that you're actually getting a lot of social and familial and, and friendship and spouse spousal support for it because you're pleasing others right. and they're getting what they want from you. Right. So Absolutely. you get a lot of, you get a lot of love, <laughs> but Absolutely. conditional love. <laughs> right. It's, it, it's conditional. And the problem is that it builds a pressure inside of ourselves of, wow, I'm really not honoring myself. I'm not saying what I need. I'm not really being authentic. I'm not really, I'm being not throwing real. a temper tantrum when I want to throw a temper tantrum. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm not saying, or sometimes it's like, I'm not saying no when I need to say no. And saying no is a really important path in any kind of spiritual, emotional healing Say practice. No, no is one of the most powerful words in the universe. It's yes. just as yes is. A- absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. And saying no opens the doorway for a true yes, you know. So, but I totally say that. And you, even if you look at Hollywood right now, too, 
you know i mean a lot of good good boy and good girl masks you know pretty faces and you sometimes you can just look at people and just see um you know famous people and they have this huge smile on you can see in their eyes there's so much pain oh my god that happened to me the year i think britney spears went crazy and she was like Mm -hmm. shaved her head and was like beating people with umbrellas i saw an interview with her right before she kind of unraveled and she Mm -hmm. had you know the perfect hair and the perfect makeup and she had this Mm -hmm. huge smile on her face and she had just done an international tour and they were interviewing her on e or you know entertainment tonight or insider or one of those shows and i was with my roommate i was in college at the time and my roommate said oh that girl just looks so sad she just looks so Mm -hmm. sad and i was like what are you talking about and i wasn't at that time I wasn't in tune with that level of myself and looking back I totally see what she was talking about Mm. because soon after Britney Spears at the time began to self unravel Mm. and and you can see it in people even if they have the big smile and myself you know when I was going through a very deep depression in my early 20s I always had a huge smile on my face Mm. you know because it was I I I would go out and I would make other people happy and then it would fill my void a little bit but I Mm. wasn't being filled from the inside like you said right absolutely so that's really important. Um, so let's talk about some of the light because we talked about the shadow, but the light's, yeah. light's pretty fun. Yeah, light's way fun. <laughs> so <laughs> and we have to go through the darkness, talk to the light. So we do. <laughs> so we did that and now we're in the light. So right. what are some of the the uh, emotional traits in the light? Yeah. Well, the light is really um, the light is really just the essence of who we are. Um, light is really just it's the unconditional love force. Um, mm-hmm. Or the energy. I mean, if you're religious, a, it's a soul. Bunch of different if you're words. whatever you want to yeah, call it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. You're, if you're not words. religious, it's just whatever. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> I mean, it could be God. It could be called, you know, I mean, you know, chi. I mean, it's, it's there's so many words to describe what we're talking about. You know, we call it gaga goo I mean, who cares, right? <laughs> but it's like, but at the end of the day, it's really just that energy. Um, the light is really the kind of like the um, core of who we are. Mm-hmm. It's the core of who everybody is. And it's kind of also the place, it's the place where we're also connected. Um, together so when we talk about equality it's like connecting with the space teaches us about equality Um, it shows us equality it shows us the oneness of everything Um, a lot of times oneness of everything is like a really esoteric metaphysical woo woo hippy dippy thing but you know um, none of really what I feel we're talking today is really in essence a metaphysical woo woo or hippie it's very grounded it's very real so you're talking about essentially life energy is that what I'm hearing sure yeah so whatever Um, it makes a difference between a corpse and me. That's yeah, what you're talking essence, about. Essence, spirit, soul, you know, love, energy, God, you know, whatever it is, right? Um, now, I mean, there are people who don't believe in that. And that's fine. You know, they don't believe in that. Um, what I'm talking about is just, you know, a way of, of, of looking at things. And even if you don't believe what Lee is talking about and you, and you just totally don't believe in any of it, the value of what Lee is saying of being good to yourself is regardless of any type of spiritual belief Mm -hmm. being nice to yourself and being forgiving to yourself are proven to be psychological psychologically healthy so why not choose something that's going to be healthy for your mental well-being yeah you don't need to believe in god to do spiritual practice you just need to believe in yourself (laughs) i love that that's it (laughs) And, and if if you're if you're an atheist or a humanist that is really powerful yeah because you're saying that you know that maybe there is nothing else out there we don't know. So so put all of your love into the person you see in the mirror. Oh, yeah. I mean, this work doesn't discriminate by people who believe in God and who don't or different belief systems. I mean, it has nothing to do with that. I mean, we're just talking about ourselves. We're talking about, hum- we're human, talking about human, human, the human experience. Yeah. We're talking about human experience. We're talking about being a human. Being a person. Being a person. <laughs> and what's so funny is it's interesting that we're talking about this in relation to light. Because oftentimes in a lot of spiritual practices, it's seen that humanness is separate from spirit is separate from um from god from or whoever. god from light yeah but what i think is so profound is talking about how um we need to go th- through and embrace we need to embrace our humanness to embrace and get to our divinity hmm. and um we this is what we're given you know we're humans we have this body we have this spirit we have this soul we have everything about this, this mind you this know? heart whatever yeah, yeah. we all of this so it's like you know this is what we're here to love is all all this <laughs> you know all this and so um none of this is about rejecting the human experience to get to the light this it's all about all accepting about, the, and going through the human experience this is about accepting the human experience you know as a part of the light and it's really amazing because as we do that we begin to really really understand the depths of our worthiness like because there are very it's 
the the depths of our it can't really even be talked about or spoken i mean the depths of our worthiness is um it's it's just it is what it is and so it's for us to connect with that you know um is 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 transformative and whatever negative stories you have about yourself to the listeners out there it's just that it's a story it's not a truth Mm. it's not a a truth about you you know nothing that has ever happened to you defines who you are you know if you've been raped if you've been molested if you've been beaten if you've been treated like trash all of the negative experience that you have it doesn't take away from the essence it doesn't take away from the love that's inside of you you can still create love you know inside of you even if you've been through hell and back Mm -hmm. Yes. you know even if you've been through hell either either a self-induced hell you know through through beating yourself up or, or drug abuse or whatever or an actual hell maybe you were held captive you're a prisoner of war who know who cares mm. it it doesn't take away from who you really are mm. which is which is someone who has the ability to love themselves unconditionally because no one can take that away from you you control that you control that yes yes absolutely and what we do has nothing to do with our value or worth either it's it's just simply who we are <laughs> so what's amazing is that then we can stop doing and trying and to get love to get love and to get that sense of worthiness it's like if we just realize that it's just simply who we are then we're actually attuning and aligning to a deeper more spiritual consciousness and so you don't have to go and volunteer and do all these good things for people that's very nice and it's great but you know are you coming from a place of you want acknowledgement you want people to Mm. see quote unquote what a good person you are yeah you know I i mean yeah and also i don't think we you know, we can all do all those things. You know, it's 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 important that we lend a hand in our society. You know, it's important that you know what we're talking about is kind of the underlying we're talking about understanding self-worth. of self worth. Yeah, exactly. um, but it doesn't mean to not go out and do um, charity events and stuff like that. And no, it's those okay. are great, but and it doesn't okay change your do that. It doesn't change your worth. Your right. and it's and it's even okay to do that and think, okay, I'm going to do this to get self worth. That's even okay. <laughs> but you know, really, but as long as we're aware of it, you know, as long as we're aware of it, that's all. You know, so we go, okay, so I'm doing this to get self worth. Yeah, I want to look really good, pat myself on the back. You know, and um, and clean this, you know, schoolyard or yeah. you know, whatever it is that we're doing, and that's beautiful. And we can do that, and you know, give ourselves that pat on the back. But at the same time, also realizing that you know, our self worth really isn't dependent on that, um, and that you know, we make choices that are really in harmony with who we are, and you know, we also waste less. You know, we don't waste time when we're trying to when we're not doing things to try to get love and approval you know like we're, we're more, we're how more much productive. time do you waste trying to get a appease yeah, others right. in your life yeah exactly there you go right or some of us appease others who aren't even around anymore yeah right and that's a trippy <laughs> one right and that's that's a great point because then also then we get to see that all these voices of um how we repress the light and like we we're talking about um becomes internalized from other people so it starts on the outside then we repeat that story over and over again. If my, if like my, you know, mom said to me, you know, you shouldn't do that anymore. You know, she might never have said that again, but I will repeat that for the rest of my life and it becomes internalized. And, and that's, that's part of why yeah. the work is very internal. And that's why it's very, very important, you know, to, to be careful with the energy that we put out there, hmm. um, especially with children and, and to make sure that children un- understand that um, because, you know, maybe, you know, in a fit of rage one time, you know, as a father, you say, well, you know, you're just worthless. Mm. And that child will internalize that. And maybe that will become a conversation that they have for the rest of their lives that they're worthless. Mm. And that's not true at all. And so it's, it's very important, you know, as parents, if you do yell at your kids or say very mean things for you to explain to them, Hey, I was in a bad mood, this and that. And also they have their own spiritual journey to go on to, but, um, just as a, as a side yeah, note. Yeah, and with that too, then that then it's also important in that situation that the father takes responsibility and so does the child for the reaction. Mm-hmm. So maybe the child doesn't take responsibility as a child. But when you know, they get older. Maybe when they, when they, you know, whenever it becomes to them. I mean, maybe it does come to them as a kid, but maybe it comes to them as an adult. And to say, say hey, okay. I, I continued the dialogue. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I take my responsibility dad did for say my this, reaction. But I, yeah, yes, exactly. exactly. Oh, Lee, what a wonderful, wonderful episode. Um, unfortunately, I have to wrap up. How can people find you online? How can they hire you, yes. you to come and speak at their meditation center, their yoga center, their school? Yes. How can people find out about you? Uh, you can find my blog, a compassion com. So again, that's a compassion 
www.wordpress.com. Um, you can also, um, my email is lee.choladenko at gmail.com. You can find me there. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, and I can post something to, to your blog too where people can. Great. And we will have a link to his blog um, on the website, outoftheboxpodcast.com. So check out our website and click on the support button. Um, if you use one of our affiliates, then it helps to support the podcast. We are accepting also Bitcoin and Litecoin subscriptions if you want to support Out of the Box Podcast. Out of the Box is sponsored by HugMeTees.com. Spread love, give a hug, HugMeTees.com. And as always, we love your positive comments on iTunes and Stitcher. I want to thank all the new subscribers. We've had a bunch of new subscribers lately, and we're very happy about that. And as always, I'm at Funny Rosie on Twitter. This has been Out of the Box Podcast with Rosie Tran. 